This week on the Rugby Paper Podcast, as well as unpacking all that there was to digest from England's loss against Wales and their World Cup squad, we turn our attention to defending champion South Africa and how they're shaping up for the World Cup. To help us do so, myself and the columnists are joined by World Cup winning centre and fly half Henny LaRue. It's the turn of the defending champions to go under the Rugby Paper Podcast microscope as we continue our rundown of the leading nations as they continue their prep for the World Cup. We will, of course, also be looking at the England squad, which was announced just a couple of hours ago. Um, South Africa announced their World Cup squad squad this time tomorrow as we record. Um, So stay tuned for all of that. But first of all, joining myself, Nick Kane, Brendan Gallagher and Chris Hewitt today is is a South African World Cup winning fly half and centre in Henny LaRue. How are you, Henny? Very good, thanks, Ollie. Good stuff, good. Where are you calling us from? I'm in a place that very few English people will be able to pronounce. It's called Kabecha, but it used to be the old Port Elizabeth. Okay, amazing. What's day to day looking for, um, for you right now? The last we sort of heard of you was your work with the South Africa Players Union in the on the rugby front. Yes, that took uh, me on a couple of interesting trails and uh, was involved in founding the Players Association all the way back in 97. Uh, It was a very interesting period where there was a lot of arm wrestling with the hierarchy of the old establishment. And uh, I think players uh, stand a much better or stand in a much better position today as a result of the players' unions across the world. And at the moment, you are, well, we were just talking about it off air, you're involved in your own sort of, well, I refer to it as a safari park, you call it a farm. Um, Is it a kind of one one or the other, or are they kind of synonyms? Yeah, look, South Africans usually refer it to a farm or a reserve. And uh, yeah, we, we try and, you know, breed game and do game viewing and uh, try and run a sustainable uh, safari business out of it. Amazing. How long has that that been going for? I've had the property for about 26 years now. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. Awesome. Well, that's, that sounds um, very, very interesting. Let's talk about South African rugby a little bit. Um, Working backwards, obviously, I'd love to talk about 2019 and your experiences of 95, etc. But for the moment, I just want to ask what your makings are of the sort of Springbok trajectory ever since that World Cup win in 2019. It was obviously a bit odd. We didn't see the Springboks on a rugby field all that much in 2020 for obvious pandemic related reasons. And then we had the Lions series and then another hiatus after then. So what have you made of the last couple of years? Well, obviously, there's there's been a change with South Africa moving from the Southern Hemisphere playing in the North. I think there's quite a, a big adaption there. Uh, that alignment uh, would bring a, about an acceptance and a change in the way rules are interpreted, in particular up North versus the way rules are interpreted down South. Um, so from that point of view, I think on a broad base, you'd find that uh, South Africa would have benefited out of playing uh, certain games in the Southern Hemisphere as well as as experiencing your Northern Hemisphere referees. So, uh, you know, the interpretation, I think, is critical. The way coaches uh, and, um, you know, particular parties that are technical, how the referee interprets particular aspects in play is becoming under scrutiny. Uh, There's been a enormous growth uh, in terms of of, uh, technology and so forth since 1995. So, uh, yeah, I think all bears towards, uh, you know, more cleaner, more efficient uh, game of rugby. How has that corresponded with the way the Springboks have adapted their game? There was talk, maybe less so in the rugby championship, but in the autumn last, last series last year, certainly the game against Izzy, for example, of a more expansive brand um, that was obviously built on the Springbok DNA, which you can never stray too far from. But uh, but the likes of Curly Aronser and the Kanyo Am, who's obviously had his injury struggles, being able to light up a field in a way that perhaps you haven't seen from recent Springbok sides. Very, very much so. I think traditionally South Africa was very much about grinding the game into set pieces, 
creating you know opportunities of set pieces and positioning themselves on the field to capitalize off that. Um, there is a definitely under Rassi been a, a change to try and uh, create a more open, expansive uh, flow. Uh, South Africa relies very much on its defense. And, uh, you know, that's where the open, expansive game was only brought in once you're, uh, you know, a couple of points ahead. Um, and I think Rassi has tried to 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 make that adaptation within the general play uh, of, of of South African rugby, and um, yeah, he should be he probably should be commended for that. You see, is that can... history rewriting itself a little bit? I remember you as a young player being an attacking fly half, and then on the eve of the World Cup, uh, you moved to centre, and Joel Stransky came in at ten, um, and. I mean, Joel could certainly, you know, he had he had the, the complete game, but I saw him more as a, a steady Eddie at 10, a safe pair of hands, and you as a more sparky player. Is that the way you it, inevitably people go when you get to tournaments, when you get to big tournament rugby, you, you go for the slightly safer option? Yes, it is. I, I think as the, the tournament progresses, you know, it's all about eliminating mistakes and doing your basics really well. And if you can dom dominate in lineouts or you can dominate in scrums uh, and, and, and force those basics down and make sure that your defensive pattern uh, is not leaking, then, then any team's got a chance you know, in, in a World Cup. I think the capabilities of the top six teams are, are all very, very similar. Uh, it's, it's a question of executing correctly, making the right options and, and getting those key game starter, uh, you know, positions within the game uh, under the knee. And if you can dominate in those parts, well, then you stand uh, a much better chance of dictating the nature of play. And I think there are nuances involved with that, which, you know, attract the ability towards creativeness if you are starting to get on top of the players. Uh, you need you need New Zealand are a team that that's arguably I don't even think it's arguably I think it's factually correct that they just are the most consistent team you know year in year out uh, you know for for years and years uh, and and yet there comes a time where uh, as in a World Cup for example where if you get exposed in one particular concentrated area. You can expose a weakness and and capitalize that. And when it's knockout, you know it's 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 time to go. So uh, these are the elements that that all make the World Cup so exciting. So, so the sixty four thousand dollar question is: if Andre Pollard is fit, do you go with Andre Pollard as your ten or a more attacking option, as in uh, Vilemzi? Well, you know, in both those instances, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned because, uh, you know, Pollard. They were talking about that he's not going to be match fit, or he wouldn't have played a lot of games. You know, by the start of the World Cup, so so that to me is a concern. I I think you only really start getting into a team rhythm, you know, by game five, six, and and that's one of the aspects as much as 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 there's a good discussion to have around having two A teams. Um, the the counter argument is is that two two A teams that are constantly being mixed up with players becomes unsettling for the players in the sense that uh, you you don't always have that ability to read the the actions of the player. Uh, the more you play with a person the more you start reading their body language and that body language is a critical aspect to, to, to making the right decisions in very, very short periods or short times where you need to act instinctively and, and react instinct, instinctively. If it, if it's, if it turns out not to be Pollard, um, Henny who plays the lion's share of, of, of games at the world cup, and we know from history that those tournaments come down a hell of a lot to, or can come down pretty pretty much to goal kicking and a consistency of goal kicking. It's why the All Blacks 
one of the reasons the All Blacks stick with Moonga, they don't play Bowden Barrett at 10 now because his goal kicking is is probably 10% down on Moonga's. We've seen Cheslin Colby kick, we've seen Valencia kick, we've seen Faf de Clare try it. I mean, you you know, you played with Stransky, you could kick a few yourself. I mean, do, does that aspect of the Springbok game concern you? The consistency of goal kicking? It, it, it does. You know, I think when you start creating this aspect of, of, of a ex more expansive game, you run the risk of, of your traditional type of fly half that has, let's call it, the ability to have an upwards of 80-85% kicking accuracy of, of losing that element. Um, so so that's, that's always a gamble. And, and I, I think that's been one of France's biggest problems, not of late. They have improved their kicking significantly in the last couple of years. But but previously, they didn't pay much attention to that. And I think they lost a lot of games as a result. Mm -hmm. It seems a an extraordinary thing, doesn't it? In a, in a way, Henny, because goal kicking is a closed skill. It's one that can be practised and practised and practised. And the idea that um, you know, that having an attacking fly half precludes him also being a, an extremely goal, good goal kicker or having another player at fullback or somewhere else who can goal kick to, you know, 85% plus just seems very, very strange to me. You know, particularly in a professional sport now, you would have thought that everybody's analysed the need to have a gun goal kicker or actually you've got to have more than one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Look, it remains the, the easiest points to score, you know, uh, is, is to to take your penalties and, and, and capitalise on those. Um, in fact, in, in, in teams where, where both parties are, you know, the defence is, is, is very, very difficult to break through, that is the most critical factor, you know, on, on the field. So... Uh, I'm 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 am a little bit surprised, but I assume, you know, if you have a look around, you'll find that most people can get a 65 to 70 percent success rate, but it's that one two, you know, penalties that should be knocked over that aren't that really cause the difference, and I think it it has a broader impact on that because. You know, forwards like to grind it out and, and get paid for the effort. Um, and I think to a large degree, if the forwards pick up that the um, that the kicker is not on song, it, it, it does affect you a little bit psychologically. Um, so it, it is critical when decision gets made to go for polls that at that 80 at least percentages uh, are there obviously depending on on the difficulty but but you should be aiming for 80 at least yeah what yeah. what's the assumption henny about Liverpool's goal kicking i mean i mean he's obviously clearly a, a very exciting player um but do, I, I, I've, I've confessed my ignorance i don't know enough about his goal kicking stats to work out what kind of marksman he is um yeah i don't think he he meets the staff of a nice Buerta or someone who is traditionally, you know, known for his goal kicking. Um, but as you say, uh, you know, I, I believe more money should possibly be spent on someone giving him direction on the field. And, uh, you know, it was, it was quite interesting. I, my, my very first tour to, to Australia, I, um, uh, I came back and I was, I was quite amused because, they, I think, had one fifteenth or one twentieth of the number of players that South Africa had, and, and were were not as consistent as New Zealand, but they, but they were really competitive, and and a lot of that came out of out of their academies and the way that they uh, looked at the game outside of outside of the field as such, and and um, the way they applied different mechanisms. To, to improve, uh, you know, the quality of, of, of each player. And, and uh, it was a lot more driven towards the individual back then already within the teams that had limited numbers. South Africa was blessed with, 
with large numbers of players and those players were discarded at lib, you know, for, for just, uh, you know, for looking at someone incorrectly. But... Um, <laughs> the, the <laughs> there sounds a man who's been there yeah. by the sound of it, Annie. <laughs> we had a bit but of that reality, as well. <laughs> yeah, so, but the reality is, you know, those, uh, everything has, has changed. Everything has become a lot more professional. Uh, one doesn't need to be a scientist to, to recognize or realize, uh, you know, that you go to professional sports, you learn from them. And, and, and they kind of give you some guidance and advice. And that's how, you know, the first academy started, you know, in South Africa. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of what we tried to do was to, to try and understand what Gridiron was doing, because they've been professional for years and years before rugby went professional. You know, we, we were under the impression in the 90s already that the referees weren't capable enough to manage the game on their own. And, and that was just a question of time that the touch judges would be getting involved. Uh, you know, money's tight in, in the sport in many instances. How do you create more value within the sport? You create stoppages, you create advertising time, et cetera, et cetera. Gran, you know, taught us this in the 90s already. So the, these elements... Do do all form part of this uh, this new rugby uh, that we're living today? Do you feel? I mean, a couple of the names mentioned: Manny Libuk and Damian Willem, sir. Do you feel that Lib the general feeling is Libuk has emerged as the front runner? Should Pollard not make it? Do you feel that that's the case in the over the course of the rugby championship as well? Obviously, we saw them play. Libuk was at ten. And Willems are at 15, which is obviously a very legitimate um, way to deploy them both as well. But for that 10 shirt, you see Manny as the way to go. At this stage, yes. Um, Willems uh, is, is, is got, got a great step and he's very, very creative. But the, 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 the South African forwards are, are people who like consistency. They like to be set as particular goal, been set a particular path. And, and operating under a certain set rules, in a sense. Um, they do deviate from that every now and then, but when the chips are down, they, they like to back themselves within that uh, general you know, form of play. So it, it becomes of critical importance that when you are really under pressure, that everyone can rely on the fluff to do what he's expected to do. Is it is it um is it the case? Uh, I mean, we always used to say, Henny, back in the day, that the forwards are just the piano shifters. You know, you guys were the piano players. The rugby was really all about you guys. Was there ever a point where you felt able to wander along to Osterant or um or or Pinar or Ruben Croyer and say, hey guys? Keep out of it. We're the artists on the field. Just give us the ball and we'll do the rest. Or were you just too scared to say that stuff? No, we regularly told them that. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't listening. Yeah, well, you know, they blame their cauliflower ears on that, but uh, we, we let them know either way. It's just... <laughs> and it was and right. you, had, you had James Small to fight with them anyway, so you're okay. <laughs> Yeah, James was an enigma. He 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 was interesting. Look, uh, there was never a dull moment with James around. Um, yeah, well, oh, James, shame, rest in peace. He yeah, yeah. he he really was a an interesting character. Henny, you mentioned Francois Pinar there, and of course, many of our listeners, their abiding memory of you is with Pinar on your shoulders at Ellis Park. God knows how you did that after a hundred minutes of rugby in the final at altitude. I mean, fantastic effort on your part. But just tell us a bit about Pinar. 29 test matches only, 29 as captain. Uh, you knew him even you know before the South Africa test career. Um, how important was his leadership in 95? And how much of a an absence or a loss will it be if, if Sia Khaleesi can't make it back uh, next month uh, in France? I think, yeah, I mean, let's let's tuck back into, into Francois's role. I think his role in 95 was 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 a critical element. You know, we, we had a team of 
very, very strong character, very strong willed individuals who, who all, all thought their opinion mattered. And um, it, it, it was harnessing, you know, that group of individuals in, in, into something that we all believed in uh, that was critical. And, uh, you know, Francho had a, had a very, very difficult role to play in that. But, you know, he, he was also our captain within the, uh, the Lions or the Transvaal side at the time. Yeah. So he had our respect and, and you know, he, he was someone who, who made the decisions in accordance. So, so, so from that point of view, you know, he had the support of, uh, he, he, he had done himself well of the task because uh, it, 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 it's never really easy when the pressure's on and big decisions need to be made. So, uh, you know, my gesture really on the day was was to to kind of elevate him and and, and thank him for for his efforts. Okay. And Sia Kalizi, is he just as important? Or I mean, he's already won one World Cup as captain, so he's already proved himself as a leader. But is he a is it a vital role that he get that he gets back next month, or will South Africa move on whether he can make it or not? Look, I, I think, uh, you know, Sia obviously has something within the, the team that, that positions himself, uh, you know, in, in the course of play. And, and uh, you know, the parties obviously respect him. I, I'm not at the, in the inside of the team environment to be able to call and, and, and understand and know, you know, to what extent he, he, he binds that team together. But they've had success. One uh, one has to respect that. Um, do I think the the other open side flankers with with a lot of skill and capability should he should he not be available? Uh, I think South Africa are are blessed with that. So uh, as much as we hope that that Sia is uh, is is on for for the tournament, uh, you know I do think we we have uh, substitutes for him. Just as a bit of an aside, Henny, uh, Khaleesi, we, we know, comes from your part of the world, from, from Eastern Province, I think, originally. Um, and Eastern Province, right the way back in the day when, when I first went there and way before South Africa, uh, well, maybe before I went to South Africa, East, East, the Eastern Cape was well known as the big thriving area for multiracial rugby in the country, it had a real sort of foundation of cross-community rugby. Does it grieve you to to see the fact that Eastern Province or any derivative of Eastern Province isn't isn't right up there at the very sort of top level in in URC and 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 those big sort of cross border tournaments. It's uh, it's, it's it's heartbreaking. In fact, it's 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 really tough because you know it's the biggest province. There's probably the most number of rugby players historically coming out of the Eastern Province. Um. But the management just didn't, uh, of, of the game, when we, there were six test unions back in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, Eastern Province were a very competitive side. It was amateur and unfortunately the boys drank too much on a Friday to be really successful on a Saturday. But the, <laughs> the, the reality is, um, you know, there, there were some really big names and competent and, and, and good players there. In fact, uh, I can tell you a little story that very few people uh, would realize that the only cup that Eastern Province ever won, I think, was in 1991. And um, and, and and that was a, a cup that was played in the evening. And it was a, the only national cup that Eastern Province ever won because it was on a Tuesday evening because it wasn't a weekend. <laughs> and that tells you a good story on its own. <clears throat> So, so from a social point of view, I think uh, you know the Eastern Province are front runners on the social side of things. But uh, yeah, they, they, it's it's a, it's always been you know a great province delivering some some really good good rugby players. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you about the sort of feeling back home relative to ninety five and twenty nineteen, and obviously the parallels were made in terms of what both meant for um, South Africa. And it was P Francois Pienaar himself who said that 2019 was a bigger deal because you'd gone from 
the 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 sort of aftermath of apartheid in 1995 um to a team of all races with obviously Khaleesi lifting that trophy what was the reaction back home does it feel like a bigger deal obviously maybe difficult says you were involved in 1995 and not in 2019 but publicly how did it come across Look, I mean, when South Africa won a World Cup, there are not elements to it, in my view. You're winning the World Cup and, uh, you know, it all, all counts uh, the same. Uh, it, it is definitely a, a bigger ask. We had the, the uh, privilege of running out in front of home crowds where, where 2007 and 2019 were, were away from home. So from that point of view there's definitely a tick to to say that it was a lot more difficult um to to achieve that and um yeah so i'd i'd probably concur with, with his view on it uh, you know we we were carried on a on a wave of emotion in 95 um uh, and 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 uh, that probably wasn't there for the 2007 to 2019 tours. Um, South Africa are, are masters at conducting a campaign, you know, three World Cup, successful World Cup campaigns. It's going to be slightly different this year, is it not, in that you're going to have to have an act, almost like play two finals if you're going to win. Because that quarter final, whoever it is you play, um, France or New Zealand, is going to be an, an unbelievable monumental match. You're going to have to peak for that match as well as two weeks later, if you're going to win the final. Does that does that change the dynamic of that campaign a little bit, this year's campaign? Look, I don't know how one changes the dynamic. You gentlemen are all in the sphere of influence there. Can you not make a plan of how the draws take place? <laughs> you guys have been doing this to us for years and years. You've been placing South Africa in the, in the group of death for the last... 25 years. <laughs> yeah, but, we we, uh, we, we yeah. used our influence, Henny. England have Argentina and Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, look, it, it, it is a tough ask, you know. I think um, to, to a, a, a large degree, you know, the art sides are going to end up there that could very easily be the two contenders for semifinals that are kicked out before they get there. So there is an element of, of head scratching around that. And I hope the authorities do uh, do have a look at it because uh, it, it would be unfair in a sense that the bounce of a ball or a penalty from a referee might, you know, preclude, you know, really good quarterfinals, semifinals, which, which really should be uh, managed in a manner that, that the best teams get to the highest positions. Penny, I think you'd find that everybody here would agree that the World Cup draw process, as it's been um, for the last three or four or maybe, you know, time immemorial, that the World Cup draw process is, is completely outdated and that the draw has to take place much closer to the tournament so that, um, you know, recent world rankings are, are reflected as they are in football um you know there's no earthly reason why why the world cup draw should take place three years before the world cup it's nuts it doesn't make any sense at all yeah. and um uh you know this this time round what we've got is a tournament where as you say you know it's uh, the the really the top teams are stacked in one half of the draw and there are large tracks of the of the world cup as a consequence where there'll be lots going on there but there are elsewhere in other pools there's not a great deal going on during the world cup you know it's a it's a long tournament in which um you know there there'll be a, a series of firecracker games quite close together uh on one half of the draw but elsewhere it's rather drawn out um too drawn out much too drawn out so uh there's a lot. I don't know what your thoughts are as well about running a second tier tournament that, you know, either precedes uh, and feeds into the World Cup so that you've got the second tier tournaments are really firing. You know, you take the the last four semifinalists, perhaps, and they are the the teams that go into the draw for the uh, for the main competition. 
Um, you know, there are all sorts of things. I, I'd be interested in your view. I, we, we sort of feel that there are all sorts of things that are not being done that in a professional sport, and we're talking about professional now for, you know, 30 years or so, 30 years plus, you know, that, that need to be done. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd, I really would agree with that. A lot of the players, um, you know, there's issues surrounding uh, player burnout and so forth as well. Uh, you cannot expect players to be playing provincial rugby, playing international rugby. There needs to be a whole streamlining effect in terms of, of, of how these competitions are put together, how you know, players are positioned and, and, and requested to, to perform in particular areas to bring about a, a more concise or, or a, a more filtered approach in, in, in terms of the game holistically and, and generally. So uh, from, from, from that point of view, uh, an, over, an overview and an overlook of, 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 of how this has turned around, uh, I think we, we're ready to, to receive some, some new ideas. One thing I wanted to ask about, which I actually asked our Irish guest, Willie Anderson, last week, was that quarterfinal. I asked him who you'd rather play, obviously getting through the group stages. No given at all, given that you've got to go up against Ireland and Scotland. But between New Zealand and France, who would you rather face in that quarterfinal at the moment? It's a, it's a, it's a very, very difficult question. Um, you know... I've got a bit of French blood in me from very, very far back, having a surname Leroux, but the, the French have have improved the, their mannerisms and consistency on the field significantly. And they're playing at home. They're going to be a very, very difficult team to beat. Um, New Zealand has retained their con consistency all, all this time. But, but South Africa does have... Uh, a way every now and then to to get under New Zealand's skin, albeit one in four or five times, but but they do have that knack. Um, France is a bit of uh, an enigma, and then that you never really know uh, what they can produce when they are on top form. They sublime. Then they can beat any team in the world. Then it's just one of those one of those days that you just accept. Um, it's 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 a very very difficult thing. I'd, I'd you know, I, it, it's half of one and six of another. It's just it's a it's a difficult uh, question. If you, if you end up facing France in the quarterfinals, you you just hope it rains, don't you? Because you beat them really easily in Durban in '95. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that that's what we found so bizarre because you know Durban was extremely wet. I don't think I've, I've ever seen a field that wet. But you know France are more adept to playing in the wet than the South Africans are. Yeah. So I wouldn't really want to see the South Africans playing in the wet. Um, <laughs> Because I think it's it's more advantageous to be playing, uh, you know, for France to be playing in in the wet than South Africa. Sure, sure. Penny, I, mean, I always reckon that the Ruben Kruger tackle on Benazi was the moment he won oh. the World Cup. <laughs> that was you the last minute, another three that, inches, you? and you were gone. Yeah, I, I was luckily I was right on there, and uh, in fact, it was James Small who was also involved in that. Uh, yeah, if I, I remember yes, correctly, because yes, yes. I was. I was on the line, so I can commit to being. I think three inches was was too much. There was probably more like one. <laughs> it was one of those sliding door moments, wasn't it? That was nearly yeah. an entirely different story that night. Yeah, no, it it it, it was. It uh, look as I said, I you know I was there, so I can confirm the outcome of of where the ball was and. Um, it was, it was, you know, and that's as close a game as what it is. You know, these World Cups today are probably even closer just for the, for the mere content that everyone is, is, is so skilled and, and, and uh, on the same level. 
uh, physicality of it all is is very much even in the, in the, in the top six six sides. It's a question of how are you executing the decisions you make. I did, if, if 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 the Springboks do end up playing France at any point, um, well, well, it, it it could be in the quarter, well, it could be anywhere in the knockout stage, I suppose, depending on results. But if they both put out their biggest packs, that would break a few records, wouldn't it? I mean, both 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 countries have enormous packs, even by modern standards. They're absolutely huge. Yeah, they are. Uh, they are. It, it would be a good stat to follow up. Um, but as we alluded to before, the game isn't won only with the forwards. You've got some artists <laughs> at the back that need to perform. And we'll be... We, we'll really be hoping that the likes of uh, Cheslin, Colby and uh, Beware and, uh, uh, you know, those parties will come to the fore. Yeah. What What was your impression of Kane and Moody on, on Saturday night, Penny? Yeah, look, I mean... He's quick. Um, <laughs> he is quick. <laughs> he, he is very he is very quick. And, and you know, I'm, I'm always someone that... As you get older, you, you kind of lean towards experience a little bit more, particularly if you're talking about a World Cup final. Sure. But he, he's got immense talent. He's got huge capability. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the, I think the coaches are going to have some some interesting decisions to make come choosing, you know, our wingers for, for particular games. Yeah. yeah. Is it... Is, is... Is Razi calmed down these days a little bit since his um since his since the peak of his social media activities, or is he still the same Razi who um if he sees something to moan about, he'll tell the world about it? No, look, I think Razi will be Razi. Um, you know, we he, he's uh, he's come from from a, a history of of doing things a little differently and and being creative, so. Um, uh, you know, in that lies the ability to cut both ways, if you can call it that. Um, he, he's not going to um, appeal to everyone all the time. And uh, I think to, to a large degree, uh, you know, he, he, he has made some changes within rugby, which, which highlighted certain, certain aspects. And um uh, I, I know, you know, back in the, if we go back to 1995, you know, our whole approach as a as a management team was 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 very much, you know, rugby. We play within the rules. We do what we need to do, while other other parties are manipulating um, aspects surrounding that. I mean, you're talking about how people review television. Uh, I mean, it's it's become quite obvious that home game tele, televises certain aspects where where certain things happen, and and when you look for that time slot when the other one's doing something wrong, they can never find it. <laughs> so, you know, that element alone, you know, can change a World Cup. It's one small decision like that. So, so your 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 tele people your television referees and, and and how the television controls those um the camera work is 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 critical these days and and i think uh you know to keep the game fair and just amongst all the all the the, the teams worldwide they they should have a standard setup and and that, that standard setup should be called upon at any time or any place um because there, there is some some interesting, um, let's call it shaving of moments. <laughs> selective, yeah, selective yeah. editing, selective editing. Hey? That's that's the right word I was looking for. <laughs> it's a it's a big it's it's a it's a huge issue. I I agree with you. I've um, I've I've written stuff about it, and I feel that it's. But you know, it's almost like the regulation within the game begins to get greater and greater and greater because you've got regulation on the pitch. Now what we're talking about is actually having somebody who is an objective or, you know, hopefully an objective observer in VT trucks and things like that to make sure, but then they've got to have great expertise uh, themselves. They've really got to have been, uh, you know, match producers themselves to be able to detect 
what angles are not being shown and so on and so forth. So it is, it's a very big issue. Um, and I, I sort of think that you're, you're right in that it's probably got to be uh, independent uh, panels that take home broadcasters uh, out of the equation to a degree. Well, theoretically, it will be in the World Cup. It's it, it take, it's somebody doing the world feed. But, of course, you've still got who is that person looking for the angles. And as you say, Nick, have they got the experience to get the right angle? And also, they're under pressure as well. You know, That's if, it. if it's France v South Africa and there's 82,000 at the stand and 14 million watching the TV in France, they, they won't be immune to that pressure, even if they're in a little box out the back of the stand. Mm. It'll, it'll, it'll be Sean Fitzpatrick. I can tell you now. It's a done deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Henny, one thing I wanted to ask you about um, that you'd alluded to with the All Blacks is consistency. And I suppose I'm mainly referring to what um, was displayed in the All Blacks All or Nothing Amazon Prime documentary when I say that the press expectation for the New Zealand rugby side is obviously probably about as intense as it gets. Now, New Zealand and South Africa widely regarded as the two heavyweights, above all heavyweights in a rugby sense. And South Africa, as you've said, don't have the same consistency as New Zealand have. And I just wondered how that shaped the sort of public and press expectation when you don't get the results you'd want against Ireland and France at the back end of last year, whereby when New Zealand weren't getting the results, the knives would come out for Ian Foster in a way that they probably ha haven't for Ninabe. Yeah, look, you know, it, it, it's true. South Africa, you know, lacks the that consistency element and aspect. And, and, and just reverting back to this particular uh, draw and so forth, for South Africa... To consistently go and beat, you know, Ireland, France, or New Zealand, uh, in terms of the run-up, is 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 a major ask. Um, South Africa like to to come out and 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 do something unique, but similar to France in some ways, and and probably lies between France and and New Zealand when it comes to consistency, which is not 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 great, but. They do have the ability to bring about a change, which which other sides may find difficult to do. I think it's very much reliant on on analysis and how a coach uh, applies a particular game plan in a particular instance, um, and the ability to to adapt. The South African uh, approach to to rugby in the past has been very, let's call it one dimensional in a sense. Um, and and, and they, they seem to be a lot more comfortable with that. Um, and, and if you're playing two top sides or three top sides in a matter of three weekends in going towards the final, you know, to adapt to, to different styles of play because you're playing different opposition, different strengths um, may make take uh, may take its toll in 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 our inability to to adapt to to let's call it the type of game plan that's required i've just got one more thing to ask you but before we do let's do your um random rugby 15 which is the quick fire question section about sort of you and your career if that works for you yeah all good yeah yeah Cool. We'll get into it. Nickname. Uh, hen. That's the cackling one or Spike. Spike. Nice. Best rugby memory. Uh, obviously the rug rugby World Cup final. Um, but then there was a great moment at New New um, Newlands uh, scoring against England. Most embarrassing rugby memory. Um. In a Springbok jersey, playing a midweek game in a very wet field against, uh, I, I prefer to, and I, I, let, me, let me rather say I can't remember the team we played against, but I slipped and uh, missed a kick in front of the poles. Nice. 
Free game tune. Sorry? What would you listen to before a game? Free game tune. Uh, you know that I've never done music before a game, interestingly. It's, uh, I've always liked looking into people's eyes and just seeing if they're bleeding or crying. <laughs> <laughs> Post game meal. <laughs> <laughs> um probably a good steak. Um nice. best player you've played against. Uh sure. I mean they the the hordes of them, my word. You know, if you're talking about opposing numbers, you you got um Oren, Vance, um, you know, internationally staged, you know, those were kind of players. Um, you know, Daniel Carter was 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 good. Uh, really good and uh, yeah, look yeah, uh, there, there's a host of, of 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 great players that that I can call on best player you've played with probably Donny Herber favorite player right now I think the excitement of uh, Cheson Colby is probably um, would trigger me on to, to answering that question rugby idol Oh, well, that's yeah. Um, goodness, that's a difficult one. Um, let's call it. Uh, could we come back to that one? Yeah, well, I'll come back to it at the end. Favorite stadium? Ellis Park. Favorite gym exercise? Probably bench press. How that what Willie Anderson said that as well. Occupation if rugby didn't exist. Uh, game farming. Superstitions. Except for the pay. Yeah. <laughs> Superstitions. I always used to tie my leg, my socks up to the outside of my leg. Oh, Why? I see. What I don't, you're you know, you had these little strings on the inside yeah, yeah. on your socks, and you just you, those. Now I'm taking you back. You see, I'm really taking you back to our days. <laughs> uh, rugby law, you would change. I think it'll probably be, and and it seems as if it's moving in the right direction. But what what really got got to me a little is. Is the refereeing around yellow cards and red cards when it wasn't really taking into consideration the intent of the player, and it was just a blatant call without. And, and I must say, it is starting to change, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, you know, my opinion: a seatbelt tackle when you've got no other option, or someone's bearing down on you like a mole, knee height. You know how how do you stop someone uh, like that without you know doing a, a seat belt tackle? I mean, it's just it's 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 virtually impossible. So so there needs to be some refining around that, and I think the refereeing needs to adjudicate the sense of intent rather than the actual action, because you are going to have instances where uh, you know an action really looks bad. But it says no result uh, of the intent. Yeah. Very fair. And last thing, best thing about working in rugby? Oh, it's just meeting people like yourself and uh, yourselves and, and, and being being in a position to expand your horizons and, and exchanging thoughts and, and, and the social aspect of it. You know, it's a, it's a privilege to, to have... Uh, had the honor of, of doing what we do and and still having the ability to mingle with 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 people who are like-minded enjoy similar things and 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 share um you know a chat around them and could, could i just ask you very oh, oh sorry ollie go on no we're just to round it off i was going to ask for henny's rugby idol if he's got one oh. maybe it's chris yeah. you Look, I mean, I must say, you know, when you're your idols are formed when you're of a particular age, and and I remember, you know, the the full backline of the Springbok team on what would be remembered as the Flower Bomb Tour in New Zealand. Eighty one. Um, yeah, I suppose you know you had Serpentine, Buerta, Duplessis, Herber, Hermesais, Ray Mort, and Jan Hienis. 
you know, it, it's a grouping more than anything else. That backline was 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 quite unique. Um, you know, idols. Uh, you know, as, as as far as they go, we're all human. I, uh, I, I it's difficult to to idolize any particular person. I was just going to ask you, Henny. You, you, you mentioned Danny Herber, um, and I, I remember seeing him. I suppose as a a youngish bloke in '84 when England toured in 1984, and he was ju just sensational. And for reasons way beyond anything to do with Danny, we didn't see anywhere near him. I mean, I don't know how many tests he played, but it wouldn't have been that many. Can you just give us an idea of how good he was? Because to, to my way of thinking, he might have been the best 13 I ever saw. Yeah, I, I mean, I, uh, there are very few that would come. He just had a different knack to him. You know, he had he had the ball skills. He he, he could uh, you know play centre kicking uh, relatively easy. His explosiveness off the off the mark was something exceptional. You know, there are very few people that could beat him over 20, 25 yards. He just, he was just in a different level. And, uh, you know, I've, I've seen him take the ball, and pass it onto the wing and then run around the wing and take the ball on the outside and go and score, you know. Um, so he, he, his, his ability on the attack was, was, um, was, was something exceptional. And, uh, you know, in, in a day that was, was amateur, um, you know, if if he was given the opportunity to 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 play more rugby, uh, I think his his records would would be still standing today. Kenny, just before I let you go, I'm going to ask you to get out your crystal ball, and we've had a few predictions so far. Um, looking at nations gone by, I think Willie Anderson said that Ireland were getting to a quarter final, maybe a semi final last week, where do you see South Africa getting to, both head and heart combined? I'd like I'd like to see them get to a get to the final, but but semis is probably where they might get to. Um yeah. So you see them winning that quarter final against, well, probably one of New Zealand or France. It, it, it's quite possible. I'm hoping that that becomes their game of differentiation, if I can call it that. Yeah. Um, but whether they can do it the following weekend yeah. is, is is really the the challenge. Mind you, you know who they will be playing against is is at that stage might enable them to go through. But I, I don't know if South Africa has the ability to pull off three weekends one after the next. Yeah. Um, against you know the the top four sides in in the world. Yeah, well, it's it's effectively three World Cup finals in the space of three weeks, isn't it? Yeah, cool. and and you know we 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 are a little thin in one or two positions in terms of experience and um, and real capability in 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 terms of settling and changing and adapting the type the type of play. But um, yeah, look, I mean. Uh, I don't think one should ever write a sort when uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to to see us go all the way through. Awesome stuff. Well, Penny, it's been, I'll let you go. It's been absolutely fantastic meeting you. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for dropping by and hopefully maybe see you down the road at some point. But yeah, it's been great meeting you and all the best. Super. Thanks very much, Nick, Brendan, thank Chris, Ollie. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Gotcha. Bye. So at the time of recording, I think I said earlier, it's 2 p.m. on Monday. So the England World Cup squad was announced about four hours ago. The rumours were last night that Henry Slade was being omitted. And that has turned out to indeed be the case, um, which is probably the biggest headline of all of them. Um, let's give our thoughts, guys, just 10, 15 minutes or so on that World Cup squad. Uh, Brendan, I'll come to you. Is Slade the biggest sort of notable elements of that squad for you? Uh, yes, I would say it probably is. It, it's one of those ones, it's not entirely a surprise. I think we've all said before that um, perhaps Henry Slade is not producing the goods for England like we'd hoped he would. I mean, I thought he was going to be one of the great England talents when he first came on the scene. So I think his place was a bit more in danger than we thought. What surprises me is, in that case, why, why wasn't he given 80 minutes on Saturday? 
Um, if it was that close, uh, you know, we haven't seen much of his slate, have we, recently? Uh, so why not give him, you know, he's, he's served England very well. Why not give him 80 minutes to state his case? I think I've got a slight theory about him. It's all to do with the, the predominance of Owen Farrell when he's in the team. When Owen Farrell's in the team, whether it be at 10 or 12, Owen Farrell runs the show. And it's very difficult if you're the other creative back to sort of, you know, there's not a lot of oxygen. I remember when Danny Cipriani got that start in South Africa in 2018, everything from Ben, ben Youngs to Owen Farrell. Danny might as well not have been playing. And I sometimes think that uh, Slade at 13, but he's a very creative 13, very good kicker, great hands. But when Owen Farrell's running the show, he's almost redundant sometimes. Um, and he's he's done well on occasions to find a way into the game, but it, you know there's it's almost stifling sometimes. Great player that he is, Owen Farrell. That that the, the creative instincts outside him don't always get a full shout. So yeah, that's the big one. The other ones were all sort of fifty fifty shouts. Um, it's funny that Don Branch would play all six matches under Borthwick during the during the Six Nations and and, and around, um, and then not even get in the squad. But he hasn't really taken his chance to be absolutely fair. And it was a very funny back row on Saturday. You had a number eight and two number sixes. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with Bren about the Farrell thing. I, I just wonder whether this is a little signal that Farrell's going to end up at 12, you know, and they'll they'll play they'll play the Stampeder at 13, be it Tuolangi or Lawrence or whoever, because it's, it's, it seems, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a bit of a guess. Because it's a big step. It's by far the biggest step that Borthwick's made in terms of leaving somebody out. Uh, I, I think that's true because Slade's been... Play, he's played a lot of rugby for England, hasn't he? And, and um, you know, he's held in very high regard in a lot of quarters. I mean, my, my long-held idea that he would have been a hell of a 12 if he'd ever played there, not just for England, but also for, for Exeter. He never got a run there. They always played a basher at 12 and used him as a, the creative presence one out. Um, but... I, ju I just wonder whether Borthwick is going to go back towards um, a forward game management type of thing and play play him and Farrell, which did get England to the World Cup final in 2019. I it's I throw that out there for discussion. The the overall um, you know one of the biggest observations that I have is that if you just I. I Throw through forward towards the Argentina game and tried to pick a likely team out of this. And um, interestingly, I've got Ford Farrell as the 10 12 combination in it. Um, and if you look at uh, the starting 15, certainly almost every permutation will give you that 12 out of the 15 are from the 2019 World Cup squad. And then the question that you have to ask yourself is, are any of those players better players now than they were in 2019? Or have they actually slipped off a fair way? So it sort of shows you the, the conundrums that are, that are there with this squad. I mean, Billy Vunapola, I, I, I accept that, you know, Ben Earl can play number eight at a push. I accept that Ludlam can play number eight at a push, but neither of them, when it comes to the first choice number eight at their club sides, they're not it. So why they're suddenly going to be able to cut it at number eight at inter international level in a specialist position with oh. a wobbly scrum base, which is what England have definitely got, sort of fills me with dread in some ways. And then I also look at the fact that Billy Vunapola now seems to be the only specialist number eight in thirty in a 33-man squad. So, so can anyone explain to me, in words of one syllable, because I'm thick, can anyone explain to me, if you're going to do this, unless it, it, the board has decided to do this last night, if you're going to do this, why would you get rid... If you're going to get rid of Don Brandt and Tom Willis... If there's any possibility that you're going to get rid of them both, why would you have got rid of Zach Mercer at such an early stage? Yeah. Why on all, earth? It makes the, no sense to me at all. All of the above. But also, you know, what you're also looking at is a number of players coming into this squad who 
I mean, we don't know, I don't know, certainly, what element in the actual training, the fitness training, they have played because they have been recovering from injuries. So Ollie Chesham's one, Billy Vunapola's another, and there are, you know, there are there are others throughout the team. But Billy is the one who concerns me most because every time I've seen him come back from injury, I would say he takes at least three weeks, the best part of a month, to get close to being up to running speed again. And, you know, we're going into a World Cup. Maybe he'll, if he manages to play the next three games, maybe he'll be just about there. But I don't know what standard of fitness he's starting from. And um, the same with Ollie Chesham. You know, so there are so many uh, uh, sort of conundrums here. I thought, incidentally, I thought, you know, my my favourite hobby horse, the scrum, I, I felt that England were totally unconvincing against a novice Wales side, an experimental Wales side. I thought that they were lucky to get the scrum penalties that they got or not. It, it was probably a 50-50 split it against two novice Welsh props and when uh, they made the scrummaging changes in the second half and the old red rose Henry Thomas came on for, for, for Wales England, they made a mess of England, total mess so you know Borthwick's playing, looking as if he wants to play a kicking game which is predicated on having a, a, a very strong pack, well at the moment there are no signs of that very strong pack. It's actually been a very good summer to be injured, isn't it? Billy Vunapola, <laughs> Billy Walker, yeah. Ollie, Ollie, Walker, Ollie Lawrence, um, yeah. Jessam. You know, there's no there's no form there, uh, mm. the current form. Uh, we don't know what the fitness is. Um, Billy hasn't played Test Rugby for two and a half years. I yeah. mean, now he was in good nick for Saracens when he got injured. But that's a long, long way away, a long time away from the international arena and as discussed ad infinitum for most of us that zach mercer was that man from a long way out so there's some, some confusing thought processes there i think i mean one of the one of the biggest concerns uh, or an, an, an additional concern is the scrum halves you know the the pace of england's game against wales on saturday was treacle slow again and we've got, you know, we've got young, quick scrum halves who are not getting a look in. And we've got two veterans. And Danny, you know, I mean, look, they've both been fine players, you know, outstanding players in, in, in many uh, respects. But both of them had relatively average, well, they had average seasons last season. You know, neither of them set the world afire at all. So... The idea that a guy like Mitchell or Quirk, that there is not space for them, or Spencer, is just, it's its mind-boggling, really. I, I, I watched those games, um, you know, I had, I had a real day of it on, on, on Saturday. I watched a whole chunk of those games. And to see the England-Wales game directly after Scotland-France, mm. and I know these are warm-up games and there's lo loads of ifs, buts and maybes and, 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 and strange things that you can... Uh, that, that you can apply to, to warm-up matches. But the whole tempo, the whole nature of the England-Wales game seemed as though it was out of the cave mm. compared to Scotland and France in terms of its tempo, in terms of its scope, its level of imagination, its dynamism. Um, and, and that was a France side, you leave Cameron Wocky aside, who's coming back from injury. They didn't have a single first-choice player on the pitch. Mm. Not not one. Scotland were almost at full strength. So the, so the Scots may have, you know, they may not be too jubilant, actually, when they look at it in the cold light of the day. But just as a spectacle, just in the way the game was played, the way the game was approached, it was far, far quicker and more dynamic than anything that was happening in Cardiff. And I but think that's a concern. You know, I mean, it's concerning and it's concerning. I mean, I don't know whether... I, I don't believe that... Um, I think Steve Borthwick meant what he said when he said that he wanted England to play at pace, with pace. It's one of his main main tenets. He wanted them to, you know, to to raise the tempo of the game significantly. And there's absolutely no sign of it at all. There was no sign of it in the Six Nations, and there's still no sign of it. So, 
we'll see on Saturday at Twickenham whether, you know, finally we do see something like, um, you know, that sort of transformation. But at the moment, it looks very unlikely. I know that it, it, it was a massive bonus for Wales, wasn't it? I, I mean, an unexpected one, I think. Because if you've been, if you've been Lee Harpenny or George North, who were the two blokes with a lot of caps, uh, leaving bigger aside because he wasn't starting the game, but two blokes with loads of caps, Gareth Davis, I suppose, as well, but he's no longer an automatic first choice. If you've been sitting in the changing room looking around, <laughs> you know, those blokes looking around at two kids at prop and two second rows that, you know, haven't been around that long and and and, and a debutante in the centre and Rio Dyer on the wing and all that kind of, you might have thought, cracky. If this goes wrong it, for us, it could go wrong in a really big way. We could be on the wrong end of plenty here. And it and they they weren't. It's a massive bonus for Wales, just in terms of their confidence, team building confidence. It'd be very interesting to see how well they play on Saturday, actually, if they can build on that. Because I think it was an unexpected bonus for them at the weekend and a big missed chance for England. Meanwhile, can anybody tell me what was happening with Caden Murley last week? Drop from the squad, pull into the squad, back into the squad, not on in the 23 on Saturday, no attempt to maybe even give him game time and then drop from the squad again. I mean, what's all that about? Maybe he went out on the Friday night like Henny LaRue's old mates at Eastern Province. I don't know. Who, who knows? I mean, yeah, it, it, could it, be it, it was a strange Roman episode. Syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> it was a strange episode. <laughs> well, we're worryingly strange, you know, because <laughs> the one thing you, you get from both that you normally think is logical, steady thinking. And, and that was just bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We it it, it, was, it was very old. I, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, I'm. I'm not wholly, you know, bereft of of. Well, I wouldn't say I was optimistic, but uh, I mean, so, so some of the things in the squad are okay. I mean, I think Joe Marchant, for example, is well worth a place. I th I think he's a good player who does have a few, couple of points of difference, and he played very well on Saturday. Um, you know, by by England's standards, he played pretty well. Um, so yeah. I'm, 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 I think he's yeah. he's worth his place, but I, yeah. I just don't know. I can't quite pick the sort of process of the thinking in terms of this. Yeah. In terms of this this selection, I don't know when the selection was made. Really, I don't know when the when the shape of the squad really occurred to the coaches. I don't know how much onus they put on Saturday's performances. It, it's uh, I I find it all a bit of a mystery. We well, can only quite conclude quite a bit because a lot of those who did play on Saturday didn't come through. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that, that that's that's true. Yeah, that's true. That's what I think. It was a final trial but... for a lot of players. I think. Um, yeah. Well, I also. With the Henry Slade thing, also it strikes me that with a nineteen fourteen split, isn't it? There is a, you know, um, an emphasis or a premium on utility in the backs. Well, Henry Slade, you know, is he can play ten, thirteen, and probably twelve. I would have thought that might have boosted his usefulness, but apparently not. Yeah, that was peculiar to me the versatility thing because I think Henry Slade could feasibly do a job at any position from ten outwards. Whereas you couldn't say, yeah, 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 the wingers that have been picked, or obviously for the other tens that have been picked. Um, we're going to have to wrap up in a second, guys. But I, I've just got one quick question for you all. So, roughly a month and a half, two months ago, we picked our England fifteen for the twenty twenty three World Cup. I have got the starting fifteen we picked in front of me. Oh, how, this is going to be awful. How how many of those do you think are not even in the World Cup squad? Well, with my track record, all of them. <laughs> Alex Mitchell. I think we all went for Alex Mitchell, didn't we? Um, Alex Alex Mitchell's one. Uh, Zach Mercer. Zach is another. Caden Did Murray. I talk into picking Tom Pearson or not? No, it didn't pick either of them. No. no, but one of them's a winger. Oh, Johnny May? No, we didn't pick Johnny May. Talking to Seager? Yeah. Was he? Big yep. Joe, not in that. There are two There are two more. And, well, one of Hooker? them. Hooker? I mean, no, Henry Henry Slade. Henry Slade. Henry, obviously. And then our tight head prop, which was the Jersey Cow. Oh, Rapava Ruskin. And Rapava Ruskin. Well, we were kind of like, we couldn't really decide on one. So we went with the Jersey Cow eventually. But Rapava Ruskin was the only plausible rugby player. But he also didn't make it. So we're, we're already at a 67% success rate. And that's even before the tournament has begun. So... Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for pointing that out, Ollie. Yeah, um, no, that's good. It's all good. It's good. 
I'm harming my future more than your own. Don't you worry. Well, we'll make we'll make sure of that. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll be on board that bandwagon. Make <laughs> well, don't get me, don't don't worry. We're seventy six episodes in. I think that's well and truly done. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, we'll wrap up there. Um, next week, we'll be turning our attention to Wales. So tune in for that. And I look forward to seeing you men then. Yeah. Good stuff. What a fun team. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Rugby Paper Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on whichever podcast platform you use and recommend the show to your friends. The Rugby Paper is available to buy every Sunday. And to make sure you don't miss it, subscribe through our print, digital and online options at therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions. That's therugbypaper.co.uk forward slash subscriptions to get all our content for as little as 14p per day.